Hi. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Hello. Hola. Ni hao. Howdy. Explain the environment. Creativity is a social experience. You're not creative alone. Business and ESG must also be part of the solution. Today we're going to talk about things like trust and teams, and this is something that I've been studying for the past 15 years of my life. Hello and welcome to the fifth Reskill Masterclass in a series for knowledge at HEC. Uh, my name is Daniel Brown. I'm a journalist in the HEC Paris Communications Department and your host for today. Today, our Masterclass features Dominique Rousiès. Welcome to uh, this Masterclass, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, you are a professor of marketing at HEC and the academic dean at the BMI Executive Institute. You were recently awarded the American Marketing Association Sales SIG Lifetime Achievements uh, Award, which is quite a mouthful, but a highly prestigious award. At HEC, you're academic director of the H Executive Program in Sales, which focuses on monitoring and performance of sales teams. Your research, your teaching, and consultancy interests focus primarily on improving sales organizations' performance. Indeed, you recently co-authored a book on Salesforce compensation and published several research papers on Salesforce financial incentives. Um, and this summer, you published a paper in the Harvard Business Review on topics related to today's masterclass, and that is data ethics. And now, you'll be sharing with the viewers a masterclass on how firms value career paths. Over to you, Dominique. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, Daniel. I'm very uh, happy to be here with you this afternoon. Um, before I start this presentation, I would like to uh, just to reassure you, I'm going to give you the results of the, of the question we asked uh, uh, through this survey, you know, how many years should uh, salespeople and sales managers uh, wait before changing companies to maximize their income. Um, so this is going to come in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but today I'm going to um, uh, present a, a research uh, paper that was uh, published uh, earlier this year in the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science. Um, and uh, this is a um, project on which I worked with my colleague uh, uh, Ali Reza Kesavart from uh, Maynooth University in Ireland. Francis Kramar from uh, Crest uh, NSAE and Uppsala University in Sweden, and Bertrand Kellen, Michael uh, Segala, my colleagues at uh, HEC uh, Paris. So basically, the question uh, that we were interested in is, is very simple. Uh, all of us, uh, I think, or most of us at least, uh, reach a point where we wonder uh, what is our experience worth? You know, how much is my experience worth? I've been working 10 years at L'Oréal, five years at Renault. You know, how much am I worth? Uh, and it's a question that uh, employees are asking themselves fairly often because uh, according to recent surveys, employees switch roles every two to four years. So this is happening uh, fairly often. But in sales, it happens probably even more often because of the high turnover rate in, uh, in the sales function. So that's also one of the reasons we were so interested in this, uh, in this question. On the employer side now, the question is kind of similar because uh, uh, company leaders uh, have this uh, problem of setting a compensation level for the people they're hiring in sales, right? And it's a very important function in companies, as you know. And uh, they need to assess the competence of uh, the job applicants um, and the kind of information they, they rely on to uh, make this uh, judgment uh, is uh, really information pertaining to experience. And this is the type of information uh, they have uh, basically in, uh, in uh, Vita, in resumes. Let's take the example of Hertz, for example, in the car rental industry. I'm taking this example because Hertz is uh, uh, one of the uh, companies that post the highest numbers of uh, 
of uh, ads uh, for the sales function at all salary levels. Well, uh, Hertz, for example, is uh, requiring a minimum number of uh, uh, experience uh, in, uh, in the sales function, a minimum number of years, but also um, a specialization in the retail industry. So in a sense, uh, companies do frame the question in terms of work experience within an industry, uh, on the labor market, in the sales function, and maybe within certain kind of firms as well. Uh, this is, uh, uh, could be important for some, uh, some uh, uh, companies. So our question was, to, um, to, was going to be, you know, how do, um, uh, uh, ex how do employees really value their experience and do employers value the experience of the employee? And that's the question we, we try to solve, uh, to answer in this, uh, in this um, uh, research. Uh, now, when we looked at uh, the kind of knowledge that existed on this topic, we were amazed to um, uh, discover that there was not much, in fact. Uh, on the sales function, we, we, we don't know um, a lot about uh, how uh, the, the various type of career paths are, are valued. And so for this reason, we decided to work on the value of various types of experiences. And what we focused on um, is three types of experience. Firm experience, so how many years you stay within a firm. Uh, industry experience, how many years you stay within a given sector. And uh, how many years you stay in the sales uh, occupation. Because if you want to hire people in sales, probably, it seems to us that you're going to look into uh, this type of specialization. And so we, what we tried to assess was the value of this various type of uh, experience. And we wanted to disentangle, uh, in a sense, the, um, the impact of this various type of experience on compensation. And this is what we've done. And we've done that thanks to a fabulous data set that uh, um, really uh, is resulting from uh, what we call in, uh, in French the Déclaration Annuelle des Salaires, that uh, employers have to uh, uh, fill out to declare uh, the compensation of their employees every year. And that's uh, uh, for this reason that we succeeded to uh, uh, collect a nationally represent, uh, representative sample of the sales population in France. And we ended up with 19,000 salespeople and 5,000 uh, sales managers. But what is uh, absolutely fabulous is that all these people, well, we followed them over a 20-year period. So we followed them for a big part of their career, from 1994 to 2015. And so for all these years, what we have um, is data on how much they've been paid each year, okay, which job they had. And uh, what was their gender, of course, education, um, and uh, how much uh, experience they have within given firms, within given uh, sectors, and uh, within uh, the sales uh, uh, occupation. So in a sense, we had data about their experience, this various type of experience, and compensation on the other side. And what we've done is to model the relationship between these two types of information. Uh, knowing uh, what was their gender, what was their age, what was their education. So that's what we've done. So now, what did we find? Well, we find uh, interesting stuff indeed. Um, for salespeople, what we found, we confirmed, in fact, that mobility of salespeople mainly occurs uh, within a given industry. Uh, salespeople uh, rarely uh, change industry. We can understand that. But what was uh, less obvious to us is that, um, uh, uh, in fact, salespeople will become sales managers. They, they become, uh, they're promoted in the sales management job at the beginning of their career. And in a sense, the probability to become a sales manager uh, does decline uh, with sales experience. What we discovered for sales managers were more interesting, uh, much more interesting. We, find the same um, mobility within industry, but what we find, in addition to that, it's also within firm for most of them. In a sense, what we discovered is that the promotion to sales management, sales management sorry, uh, is more frequent for people with non-sales managerial experience. In other words, we're talking about lateral transfer. So 
uh, when firms want to uh, promote sales managers, they do it from other function, but not from the sales function, or at least uh, not as uh, frequently. So it gives us a picture of what is a successful sales manager and what is a less successful sales manager. Uh, and if I define success in terms of compensation level and in terms of speed of upward mobility. So the successful sales manager will have less firm experience, less uh, industry uh, experience, less work experience, will be better paid because that's uh, part of the definition. But uh, this is also a person who is going to be more likely to switch the year of the promotion. Of course, we understand that because uh, these people are generally not coming from sales, so it's probably a more difficult task for them to be promoted at this job. And so they are very fragile, so to speak, the year of their, uh, of their promotion. Now, to answer the, the survey, the question was, you know, how long should they stay in their, um, in their company? Well, the, we, the reason why we ask this question is because the relationship between uh, experience and uh, compensation is an inverted U-shaped relationship. It means there is a plateau. And if you have a plateau, it means we're able to tell you that uh, the number of years um, uh, that a salesperson or a sales manager needs to stay within a firm, within a sector, or uh, within the occupation, in order to maximum, uh, maximize sorry, his or her income. And to answer the question that you were uh, very um, uh, nice to uh, uh, answer, and I think so about 600 of you have, uh, have answered the, the poll. Thank you very much. Most of you were, were right. Um, you, uh, you did say 53% uh, uh, of you said it's three years, and you're right. It's, uh, for salespeople, it's uh, exactly 2.9 years. Okay. So in other words, the plateau is reached at 2.9 years. If you leave before, you're probably going to less, uh, earn less. If you leave after, you're going to earn less also. For a sales manager, it's a little bit more. It's 3.4 years um, the, the plateau is going to be uh, reached. Um, and this is uh, for firm experience. Now, if we're talking about the industry experience, it's about the same thing. The plateau is reached at 2.9 and uh, 3.2, I think, uh, uh, years of experience in the same sector. For the sales occupation experience, it's a little bit different for sales managers. The plateau is reached at 6.4 years, uh, where for salespeople, it's around uh, three years. So we were able to disentangle really the impact of uh, experience on, on compensation. And we were able also to devise when the plateau uh, uh, is reached for uh, these two categories of, of jobs, salespeople and sales managers. So how do we explain these, uh, these results? Um, in a sense, it's not really surprising because uh, with uh, years uh, accumulating, uh, of course, there, is, there are accrued skills and knowledge. But with technical, technological uh, evolution, it's uh, harder and harder to keep um, uh, updating your, your knowledge and skills, right? So that's why um, uh, we have this type of, uh, of uh, of relationship, this uh, inverted U-shape relationship. And there is an, also another phenomenon, which is uh, um, achievement uh, wariness that explains also the shape of the relationship. Um, how can we explain also the fact that firms have this kind of internal pipelines, you know, the fact that they're sourcing their sales managers mostly uh, within their, their, their own people in other functions? Because statistically, uh, we have three out of four um, uh, sales managers coming from the same firm, and two out of three uh, coming from other managerial functions. So how do we explain that? Well, because there's less risk. Uh, when uh, company leaders choose um, uh, their, the, the sales managers from other functions, they know them already, right? Uh, it's easier to assess their competencies. It's easier to develop their talent because they're uh, uh, internal members, right? Uh, whereas if they had to choose external uh, candidates, then there they will always be this risk factor of not uh, having uh, selected the right kind of people. Um, so what is the conclusion of this study? In a sense, we've uncovered two distinct career paths in sales, in France at least. Uh, one devoted to salespeople, to the sales job, you know, if you want to sell, 
uh, then you're better off um, uh, uh, choosing this profession, knowing that you will not, I mean, less likely, uh, become a sales manager. And the other path is sales management. That doesn't start, this is ironic, it doesn't start in sales. It uh, more often starts in other functions of the, of the company. Um, so what does it mean for sales employees? Uh, it means that if you're a salesperson, you're better off choosing another uh, function if you want to become a sales manager. Uh, but it means also something very interesting for a salesperson. Since uh, very often uh, sales managers come from other functions, it means that salespeople basically need to manage their boss, right? Because they are probably going to be managed by uh, people who have uh, less uh, knowledge about the sales functions than they do themselves. So that's um, something that is extremely interesting, especially in terms of training um, of, uh, of, of sales managers. So what does it mean for firms? Well, uh, these, this result uh, means that uh, um, in, in this uh, time of uh, great resignation, uh, um, where we absolutely uh, try to keep talent, uh, I think it's really important for um, uh, company leaders to understand that when they promote sales managers coming from other functions, they really need to pair this promotion with uh, um, other type of uh, training to make sure that uh, uh, these managers are, um, are more comfortable with the job and uh, to make sure that they stay with, uh, with, with the firm. So I think it's fairly uh, important because we saw in the data that the year they are being promoted, these profiles tend to switch uh, much more than the other type of profile. Um, I think uh, we are going to uh, move to the uh, questions now of uh, our viewers. And so I'm going to uh, turn to uh, Daniel and, uh, and listen to uh, the questions we, we received uh, from, the, from the audience. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, uh, Dominique Rosiès, for a very engaging and clarifying uh, exchange uh, and, and presentation of, of this master, master class. There have been several people writing in questions. We won't have time to cover all of them, and, but uh, you've told me that you, you're committing yourself to answering them uh, after the master class. Yes, I'll try. But I, wa I want to start with a question myself. You said that there appears to be very little research done on the sales in general. And so my question quite simply is why? Well, to be uh, more precise in sales, I think we, we see an increasing trend towards more and more research in sales. But the specific topic about careers in sales, no, there is not much uh, written, that's for sure. I think we, we suffer from uh, prejudices, uh, you know, uh, and wrong perceptions. Um, there are surveys that show uh, that people uh, trust salespeople much less than uh, other professions. I mean, uh, nurses, judges, uh, doctors in medicine are at the top and uh, salespeople are always at the bottom. So that's always been a, a, a problem. Uh, and it's, it's strange because uh, in, uh, in the Western world, I think it's 10% of the active population who works in sales. So we're talking about the large chunk of, uh, of uh, the active population. No? Um, it's, you know, there was a, a, a paper in the Wall Street Journal, I think one or two years ago, um, where the journalists were writing, you know, this is a paradox. The pay is very high, uh, the jobs are plentiful, uh, but, you know, they don't want it. The candidates don't want it. Students don't want to go in sales. Um, so they eventually go in sales afterwards, but uh, no, there, are, there is little interest, little uh, trust and bad reputation, I think, attached to this uh, 
to this tax function, right. but except for people within companies where people understand that it's a, it's a key function. You know, if if the company doesn't sell, there is no company, nobody eats, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Comedians like Jerry Lewis in Arizona Dream, who was a sale uh, selling cars, uh, I think, uh, reinforce these kind of cliches. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question uh, I'd like to move on to, and that's from Céline in Paris, who asks, how representative are your results in terms of trends in the rest of Western Europe and the West in general? Because you focused really on France. Uh, yes, that, uh, yes, yes. This is a French data set. Well, uh, it's true that I don't expect the composition level to be similar, that's for sure. Um, we've already uh, uh, seen that there are differences depending on the country and the cost of living, it's obvious. Um, but since the uh, phenomena that explain, that we think explain our results are really um, uh, the same across borders, you know, if you think of the techn technological evolution, the achievement wariness, of your crude uh, uh, sale, um, uh, skills and, and knowledge. These phenomena uh, exist uh, everywhere in the Western world. I don't expect really uh, very, very big differences. Uh, I may be wrong, you know, I'm, um, I'm obviously going to try to replicate this, uh, this study I in swear. other context. The, the only thing maybe I could, I could add is that um, uh, when, uh, there may be factors changing uh, the structure of the compensation plan, which is not a question we are addressing here. But a few years ago, I worked with, uh, with other colleagues on this topic, you know, how much um, uh, variable compensation there is in, um, in, the, in the pay of uh, salespeople uh, in Europe. And we compared the, um, uh, these ratios uh, within across six countries, if I remember right, in Europe. And we discovered that it was linked to uh, the, the tax policies. And it's an interesting idea because if you think about it, when you pay salespeople, uh, sales leaders are really trying to uh, maintain equity by um, uh, uh, creating a gap, a compensation gap between the lowest performers and the highest performers, right? If you're a high performer, you don't want to be paid like the low performer, right? So you need this compensation gap. This is what the variable compensation creates, right? Uh, but in countries where uh, the tax uh, pressure is very high, then the compensation does decrease, right? And so what we discovered in, with this study is that, um, in a sense, companies were fighting this tax pressure. And so in countries where the tax pressure was high, the variable compensation rate was very high to counteract this effect. So there are some dis differences uh, linked to uh, the ratio variable compensation, but for the rest, um, um, I don't think so. The shape of the function, probably not. Well, the questions are coming in thick and fast ah, from okay, around sure. the world, okay. and which reflects, I think, how stimulating your masterclass uh, okay. was. And there's one from um, Erwin Perez Buamda, Buamda, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, uh, in Madagascar. He's a senior manager in commercial insights and strategy, and he simply asks, how can employees enhance uh, their exposure to reach greater opportunities and move up the ladder? Um, so if you rely on the results of my study, um, uh, it would mean that uh, you uh, are better off uh, not starting in sales if you want to move up, because the path with uh, um, uh, the highest speed in terms of upward mobility is the one that starts in other functions of the, of the company. So that's, that's a paradox. If you want to move quick uh, in sales, move up quickly in sales, you should not start in sales. Mm. Uh, because uh, three out of four um, uh, of the sales managers, uh, 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 of the sales managers promoted to this job were coming from um, uh, the same firm and the other functions. Here's a question from Paul in London, who asks simply um, the fact that your longitudinal study covers this period of uh, 1994 until 2015, yes. means that you, you stopped eight years ago. How do you think um, it's evolved since then? Um, obviously, I don't have the data, but uh, what we know is that uh, talent retention is really a big question. Great resignation is around the corner. 
Um, and uh, probably the element of the study uh, that we should insist in the, uh, on is the fact that uh, uh, companies really need to be extremely careful with the newly promoted sales managers. If you think about it, um, a, bad, a, a bad salesperson has limited damage at the level of a company, but a bad sales manager you know, has a multiplier effect. Okay? It destroys many salespeople in his or her team, right? So the, the way a sales manager is uh, compensated and taken care of, more largely speaking, is crucial uh, for the performance of companies. So I would say that the, our study shows that uh, when you promote somebody at a sales management post, you really need to uh, pair this promotion with training to make sure they stay and to make sure that uh, they, are, um, uh, they have the, ne the necessary skills and competencies to, um, uh, for this job, especially since most of them come from other functions. So I would say, yeah, take care of, uh, of uh, sales managers much more. Well, my, the questions are coming in both on my computer and on the iPad. And this one's from Andrew in Boston, who, say, who says, you conclude that employees are more likely to be promoted to manager if they step out of their company and assume different uh, functions. Uh, do you have any idea why this rather counterintuitive result occurs? Um, Interesting question. Yes, it's... They don't step out of their company. Uh, let, let me clarify. They, they, they are coming from mostly from another function uh, within, uh, uh, within the same company. Um, I think we can explain it with a risk factor. Um, it's less risky uh, to uh, uh, promote people from inside because uh, uh, say, uh, company leaders know these people and uh, you can develop their, their talent. You, you, you know them, you know their performance level, you know how they evolve. So it's, it's a matter of risk, I, I would say. Mm. Yeah, it's easier. Yeah. Uh, Emeline uh, has written in a question, um, this time from the south of France, Marseille. She um, seems quite learned in uh, this uh, field. She asks uh, about this other research from Wharton that finds that the employer gets less and pays more when hiring external staff compared to promoting internal staff. Uh, could you give any advice to both employers and employees uh, as salespeople and sales managers to get more of a win-win situation out of that information? Um, what I would say is, uh, I, I know this study, um, uh, and this study is looking also at the performance. In this paper that we're talking about, we don't have performance data. We are looking at experience on one side and compensation on the other side. So uh, what we are saying is that um, uh, when um, company leaders are promoting managers to a sales management post a job, the compensation level is higher. Well, I explained to you uh, a minute ago that it was because it was less risky. Well, now if you take the if, if you go in the shoes of this sales manager, newly promoted sales manager, for this person it's very risky, right, to move and change functions. So. That's probably the reason why you need to um, uh, to raise the level of compensation, and that's probably why they are uh, they are they are better paid than uh, than the other uh, managers coming from the sales function. So that at least that's uh, an intuition we have. We only have time for a couple more questions, and and this one was sent in from the United States, doesn't specify where, uh, by uh, Abdul Karim Diallo, who we salute. So, and simply, how is AI changing the sales role? Um, it does um, probably um, uh, help uh, onboard salespeople much faster because training becomes uh, much easier. The tools are more efficient. And so, in other words, it does enhance the productivity and the efficiency of, the, of salespeople. That's what I would say for the time being. Yeah. And uh, finally, a question from Hong Kong, and this comes from uh, Tammy Toledano, who's a managing director in, in a firm, and um, asks, what are the actions that a retail brand can do to value or val valorize, uh, it's, a, I think, a French term, a retail career and attract retail talents? So 
there is something I didn't say when I, pre when I presented this paper, is that we uh, collected data from uh, uh, manufacturing sectors, not retail sector. So in other words, um, it remains to be seen that uh, um, this result apply to the retail sector. So that's why I will not commit to a <laughs> negative answer mm. for the retail sector. Uh, I'm going to stay in the B2B uh, uh, environment. But so what's lucky is that we have all the contact details of these people and yes. uh, people like Sofia Ribeiro in the Netherlands, John Hayden in the UK, um, and uh, Saad Shaouki, uh, who's actually here at HCC Paris, have also sent in questions that uh, you told me, Dominique, you'd be happy to answer yes. uh, afterwards. Um, and so, so I'd like to thank you again, uh, thank Dominique you very much. Yes, uh, for this very engaging uh, masterclass, you. reskill masterclass. Uh, be sure to tune in again uh, for our next masterclass, which is going to turn towards uh, sustainability and the environment on the eve of the next COP. And uh, we'll have uh, Igor Shishlov, uh, who will be uh, our next um, masterclass star. Thank you again for tuning in. Looking forward to uh, engaging with you very soon. Until then, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi. Good morning. Hello everyone. Bonjour, hello, hola, ni hao, howdy. Explain the environment. Creativity is a social experience. You're not creative alone. Business and ESG must also be part of the solution. Today we're going to talk about things like trust and teams, and this is something that I've been studying for the past 15 years of my life.